I regard DDEX as a real, real success story within the industry because um, it really is a truly cross-industry uh, effort, including publishers, musical work, right societies, record companies and their own societies, DSPs um, and technology service providers of various types. And they all come together. We've been here all week this week uh, in meetings, working on the standards, and they all come together in a, a real sense of joint purpose um, and, and really work well together um, and find solutions to these operational problems. So DDEX was set up to create standard message formats for communicating data up and down the supply chain. Um, we also, within that, create standards uh, of choreographies, which simply put um, are, are uh, standards that say, if you send me this message, I will send you this message back, and so on and so forth. It's about triggering what, what should happen next within a, within a communication. And then on top of that, the actual mechanisms by which those communications take place, whether that be through uh, FTP, where you put a, a message onto a server and notify your business partner and they pick it up and start using it, or in some cases, web services, which is much more automated level of exchange. Sort of secondary to that, which is why we work so closely, particularly with CSAC and IFPI, is trying to see from across the whole industry what can be done to improve identification, unique identification of the key elements um, of the business. Um, and in some instances, we have actually created our own identifiers where one doesn't ex where one where something doesn't exist. And the small matter of trying to improve metadata quality and consistency um, is, is also on our agenda. Um, but the, the main effort and almost 80% of the, 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 the time is spent on the, on the first bullet and, the, and their sub-bullets uh, because that's where, uh, that's where the effort is most needed. So DDEX is an open not-for-profit organization uh, formed in May 2006. It's a very low um, uh, uh, jump for entry. You have to demonstrate a business interest in digital media content. At the moment, we have about um, 80 plus members from the entire supply chain. And we very purposefully identified three particular groups. Um, recording rights owners, administrators, so obviously the labels and their societies like ReSound here musical work rights owners and um, their administrators, so music publishers and uh, musical work societies. And then the DSPs, the likes of Apple and Google and Amazon, along with technology service providers who are often companies offering technology um, support to smaller companies that don't necessarily have the resource to uh, do those sorts of things themselves. As a sort of add-on, because of a particular stream of work that we'll talk about, we have started to attract people who are involved in elements of the studio environment, so software companies who provide um, uh, uh, software for, for studio environments. As a member of DDEX, you participate in work prioritization, the requirements gathering, and actually develop and, uh, developing and drafting the standards themselves. Um, and it's, uh, the members very much influence the direction in which we travel. Um, they get access to all of the working documents, um, which means being a member means you're, you're ahead of the game. And although these are pre-competitive standards, and therefore I don't want to overemphasize the sort of early mover advantage in terms of implementations, clearly being in the room when the things are being discussed does give you an advantage when it comes to actual implementation. All of that is set out in legalese. There's always got to be legalese somewhere. Um, in our operating agreements, that sets out the governance rules, 
the intellectual property policy, how the standards are actually developed so everybody knows the steps that we go through in order to uh, actually get to the point where we declare a standard and, and the confidentiality issues that uh, have to be dealt with. If you remember, we're dealing with a lot of companies, particularly on the, on the retailer side, who have extensive IP, um, you know, you think of the lights of Apple and Amazon and, and Google, uh, and, and so the, the need for the IP policy and confidentiality where it's appropriate is very important for them to feel comfortable to be here. So we have three layers of membership. We have full members, um, which makes up the largest number of, of members of the organization. Um, they can attend, basically attend any of the meetings that we hold, whether they are working group meetings, our full plenaries, which is what we've been doing over the last week. Um, where we all meet physically for, for three or four days. They can propose chairs for the working groups. And then as part of the process um, of the standards development, there is a point where we declare what's called a committee draft, and they are then able to comment on that um, uh, in order that the, the, um, the standard actually is doing what they uh, need it to do. The membership fees are revenue-based, um, we were very, very keen to ensure that smaller companies could actually reasonably afford um, membership so that they could uh, participate in what we're doing. And indeed, we do have uh, a, a large number of companies um, that fall into the $1,000 um, membership fee, um, as well as others in all of those categories. The other two uh, layers of membership is uh, the charter members. They basically get exactly the same rights as the full members, but in addition, they nominate a board director. Um, and for that privilege, they, they pay a, an annual fee of uh, uh, just over $25,000. Um, the board is, is now limited to 21 companies. The point being that that divides by three 21 is a slightly odd number for a board, but it divides by three so that there is the balance of, of uh, board directors from each of the three categories that I mentioned earlier on. Um, associate members are beneath both uh, charter and full um, in the sense that they don't have the same access to the documentation as full and charter members. They do, however, get access to committee drafts and have the opportunity um, to, to comment on those. And, and they can attend some of the meetings under, under circum circumstances. The current membership list is on our website, but I would just highlight who the charter members are. So on the recording rights owners and administrators, we have um, the Society's PPL, from the UK, SCPP from France, and Sound Exchange from the US, and then the three major labels, Sony, Universal, and Warner. On the musical work side, there are um, six musical work rights societies, so from the US, ASCAP and BMI, from Germany, Gamer, from the UK, PRS for Music, from France, SASEM, and most recently from Canada, SOCAN and then Cobalt Music Publishing makes up the seventh one. And on the retailer technology service provider side, we have Apple, Google, Amazon, Spotify, and Pandora. So some pretty big companies um, that you all know of um, uh, are part of the board. And because that only comes to 18, um, we currently have three vacancies. We also have uh, relationships with, with other people that are worth pointing out. Um, in order to use the DDEX standards and actually implement them, you need an implementation license, which is free. Um, and obviously, we have a, a large number of licensees. Um, I think at the last count, it was well over 3,000 companies. And although they're not actually members of the organization, we do encourage them to give feedback on the standards so that we can constantly improve them and develop them so that they're meeting everybody's requirements. And um, the last group of people with whom DDEX has relationships is uh, liaison organizations. 
These are usually trade associations or other standards bodies. And the purpose of having um, those relationships is to enable more communication about what we're doing to filter through across the industry um, to memberships that don't necessarily have the resource to actually participate in what we're doing. Um, and in part, um, it's these sorts of events that we do with those trade associations and standards bodies in order to uh, make sure that as many people as possible uh, know what's going on and, and why it's important. Um, I mentioned the intellectual pro property policy. I won't bore you with the detail of it, um, but our meetings are confidential unless, like this one, it's, a, it's obviously declared as a public meeting. Um, and, and the working draft documentation remains confidential until eventually it's published as a, as a standard. Um, and members grant to DDEX a license in respect to any inputs that they have uh, provided during the work on the standards if that input actually lands up in the standards itself. Everything else they keep their, their own um, rights in. So this kind of all pans out in this kind of structure. You've got uh, the three layers of membership. Um, the charter members provide members, members of the board. The board appoints an executive committee um, and, uh, and ensures that there, there is a secretariat to run the activity. Um, they obviously provide members to all of the various working groups. And we have one group known as the Technology Management Group, which has a sort of oversight responsibility to the working groups to make sure that they're all going roughly in the same direction. One of the things you, you will see when Neil speaks is we use a lot of structures consistently through all the messages, even though the messages are actually for different uh, business purposes. Full members obviously provide uh, people for the working groups and the technology management group, and the associate members see some of the outputs from the working groups. So, like most standards organizations, um, we have technical working groups who focus on a particular uh, subject. They set requirements, they review any proposed solutions that um, have come out of those requirements. We meet mostly by telephone conference um, and sharing documents online, but occasionally we will have physical meetings. And then on the, the plenaries that we've been doing this week, we have two of these per year. Um, and at the moment, because uh, DDEX is, is a little bit North American and European centric, we rotate those between the East Coast of North America, West Coast of North America, and Europe. So we're in Toronto um, today, obviously. Our next meeting is in, in Paris, uh, and then we'll be somewhere on the West Coast come November. And these are very important events because, apart from anything else, it gives people the opportunity to meet their peers and um, from other companies and actually start to understand what other companies' issues are, and that very much feeds through to the way in which the standards get developed. Um, and we will occasionally have uh, regional meetings um, where, it's, uh, where there's a particular um, piece of work that needs to get done. The most important thing about this particular slide, though, is um, the, the sort of pink blob. DDEX works by consensus. Um, now, that doesn't mean unanimity. But, by and large, we do actually manage to move forward with unanimity. But the point is, what we won't do is allow a single company who has an objection to hold us back in actually moving the standards forward. If everybody else but, say, one company is saying, yeah, this is right, we, we like this, we want to move forward to it, with it, then usually the chair of the working group will call consensus and say, right, that's done, we're moving on. The standards process is pretty uh, normal for, for most standards organizations. Um, members propose a change or a request for uh, uh, new work. The board assigns that to a working group, whether that's an existing one or one that's, um, that has to be formed. The working group then goes through the activity on an iterative basis and eventually declares this committee draft. 
At that point, the standard is more or less set in stone. And we then um, have a 30-day period where all the membership has the opportunity to comment on the standards. Um, and those comments come back to the technical management group and they will, dis dis what we say, dispose of those comments. Very often they're just editorial, that you know it should be B1 here, not B2. Um, and in our experience of the last 11 years, I've not had a comment come in or we've not had a comment come in from a uh, member during a committee draft stage which actually forces us to go back and start again. Uh, and so these largely editorial comments will will be uh, brought into the revised standard, the board ratifies it, and then, and then we publish it. Uh, there's nothing particularly new there. One of the things I want to stress uh, is that whilst the focus is creating um, messaging standards or formats, these all have to work in sync with other activities, the choreographies which I've mentioned and the communication protocols. So you know, there, there's quite a lot of moving parts to this, all of which have to align. Um, and um, it, it's important to remember that, 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 that there are several things going on at the same time. The main focus of our work at the moment, uh, and this is where um, Niels will give you more detail, Release deliveries, that's usually a communication between a record company or a distributor and a digital uh, service provider, sending information about the releases that, are, that they can um, uh, 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 put in their streaming service or their download service. Sales and usage reporting, which kind of is what it says on, on, the, on the box, that it, it's where DSPs send information about sales or usage or revenue back to the rights owner, be they the record label or distributor or musical work rights owners. Works Claims and Licenses has most recently been focused exclusively on mechanical licensing in the US, which has a number of problems and there are no standard formats and we're working very close to doing that. And in fact, older versions of um, those standard formats are being used in Canada for mechanical licensing uh, as well. Um, MLC is the, the music licensing company, is the name that the sound exchanges and the PPLs of this world have given themselves. Um, and obviously they need to exchange data amongst themselves and they need to exchange data with the, the producers, with the record companies. So there's a, there's a separate message, uh, a group of messages for that. And the two more recent activities, um, and particularly the capturing data in the studio, kind of squares the circle of the whole thing, um, which is a standard that hopefully we will see adopted in software for studios, um, which people will then use to put the data in at the source at the time of creation so that the data can start to flow through the whole supply chain. Um, the, the, main, the other main standards were already in place and this was a, this was a hole in the, in the full sort of circle of activity um, which has now been plugged and there's a lot of work going on in that area that, that we will talk about later. The last one is the most recent activity that's been started which is looking at ways in which we, the industry might be able to formalise a way in which musical works and sound recordings get linked. We all know how critical that is. We all know there's a, there's a number of projects been announced on that front, but most of them have, have been, not in silos particularly, but only small groups of companies. This is using the full experience of the DDEX community to actually look at ways in which um, we might be able to, to find, a, I, won't, I won't go as far as a solution, but we might find a way of, of, of moving that particular debate forward. So for any of you that uh, know what the London Underground map looks like, um, this is our London Underground map, which shows the various different messages and who they get communicated between. Um, and um, Niels will break all of this down a little bit more um, as he goes through the, the details of the messages. 
Um, one thing I would say that is worth recognizing is whilst the outputs of DDEX are these message formats, at its heart, DDEX is really a language. And it's a language that relies very much on the data dictionary so that parties who speak different languages can actually talk to each other. So if I'm a label, I've got my data model over here and I have certain terms that I'm comfortable with and they're you know, part of my system. And I'm a DSP over here and I've got my data model, which is different, I guarantee it. And I've got the terms that I'm happy with and they all make sense to me. But if those two try and communicate together, it's going to be a mess. What, they have, what DDEX does is allow the label to map to DDEX and the DSP to map to DDEX, and then they both know what they're talking about, even if the terms to which they're mapped within the label and the DSP look different, they are actually talking about the same thing. So it sort of allows translation between the parties. Um, and, and the data dictionary is the way in which we collect all that data. It contains every term from every message that we have, um, and the numbers are quite significant. And then to finish on this section, you know, DDEX is now more or less ubiquitous. Some of the messages are more used than others, um, but you know, we do have these 3,000 odd implementation licenses, which implies that uh, you know, at least, even if we're generous and say only half of them are actually doing implementations, that's a significant number of companies across the marketplace. We don't, DDEX itself, the Secretariat, doesn't have any information directly about implementations, but there really isn't now a serious company in the business that's not using DDEX one way or another.